Welcome everyone to the IDF Virtual Advocacy Day 2021. This is our second annual uh, Virtual Advocacy Day and hopefully next year we'll have an in-person Advocacy Day and maybe have some um, opportunities for some people to do both virtual and in-person next year. And um, just wanted everybody to know, most of you know, uh, me, Jamie, and Becca, and um, we'll be our, your resources if you have any questions about this program. The agenda today is, uh, we'll, I'll share a little bit about IDF and PI, our Advocacy Day priorities, then effective advocacy, and our legislative meeting logistics. So as many of you know, this is our mission statement. Um, the Immune Deficiency Foundation improves diagnosis, treatment, and quality of life of people affected by primary immune deficiency through fostering a community empowered by advocacy, education, and research. And we're gonna be doing the advocacy and education today. And just a reminder, um, PI, there are more than 400 different types of primary immunodeficiencies. Um, these are rare diseases where individuals are missing or um, have improperly functioning immune systems caused by genetic um, defects and they're not contagious. And um, some dis disorders present at birth where others are in early childhood, but anyone can be affected. And as we know, there are over um, 250,000 people diagnosed in the US, um, but many more go undetected. So these are our legislative priorities. To, uh, I wanna emphasize, we're, we're gonna be talking about three different priority areas, um, but we're really only doing uh, one area of legislative ask. So we're gonna be talking and sharing information with legislators about protections for the immunocompromised, about awareness of plasma donation, and about access to healthcare in the home. Our legislative asks, so to speak, will be related to telehealth um, regarding access to healthcare in the home. So first, protections for the immunocompromised. Um, as many of you know, during this pandemic, uh, it has sort of highlighted the need for many people to uh, have these protections. And we've always known it, those who are um, with PI and other immunocompromised conditions, but this really highlighted it. And IDF recognized that we, along with other groups that with secondary immunodeficiencies are in a very unique position and need to need advocacy. And so at the beginning of the pandemic, we began to form the Protecting the Immunocompromised Collaborative. And in the past year, we've been engaging in advocacy, um, including issues related to vaccine access and flexible policies related to access to services in the home and addressing issues such as caregiver burden. And, um, as, as some of you have participated in, we had a congressional briefing on March 17th, and that is available online at uh, primaryimmune.org slash take action, and also on our um, immunepolicy.org, which is the Protecting the Immunocompromised Collaborative website. And, um, the other effort that we're, we want to educate people about is education on plasma donation. And a lot of you know this, many of, of our members are uh, dependent upon immunoglobulin replacement therapy. This is derived from source plasma and it's used to replace antibodies that they can't produce um, sufficiently on their own. We found during, um, you know, during the, this pandemic, there's also convalescent plasma that's been developed, which has the antibodies for COVID-19. And um, both those require people to donate plasma. During the pandemic, plasma donation has been limited because people don't always wanna go out. And um, so this puts a strain on the supply. So we have, 
made a request to the Appropriations Committee in Congress to um, ask the Department of Health and Human Services to put resources into awareness campaigns for plasma donation, not just blood donation, which is, which is something that they were going to do anyway, but to recognize that it's very important to have source plasma donation because our community relies upon uh, source plasma to get our immunoglobulin replacement therapy. So then the next issue is ensuring permanent access to home health. And as many of you know, this is um, very important to our community because like during the pandemic, it's been really important that people are able to get the healthcare they need um, without having to leave the home. So this includes infusions at home and telehealth services. So many of you have advocated for many years on the Medicare IVIG demonstration. And we're really pleased to share that this was extended in December 2020 as part of our efforts to continue to allow people to have access to IG at home. Um, this is something that we knew prior to the pandemic that people need to have that opportunity. But we want to make sure this is still a demonstration. We want to move toward this being a permanent benefit. And when you're meeting with legislators, you want to make sure that if they were uh, present during the previous Congress, that you thank them because, in fact, they, they were um, very helpful in allowing us to have this extended. They passed the legislation. And so that was really um, very helpful to us. And also share with them that we are urging CMS to make this eventually turn into a permanent benefit. And we may be following up as we continue to advocate for that with Congress to, as we, you know, ultimately our, our goal is to have a permanent benefit, but it's not necessary this year for legislation but we do still wanna share the importance of having a permanent benefit for this. And finally, the extending telehealth access. This is the area where we actually have some bills that we wanna share with our legislators. And so um, this is where you're gonna have very specific asks that we'll be talking about. As we've discussed uh, during the pandemic, there have been laws that have been made more flexible so that people can have telehealth services in the home. And many of you have benefited from this. Um, we're going to be focusing on Medicare policies, but you should know that Medicare policies influence private insurance policies. So it, it will have a big impact. If we make it more flexible to receive telehealth through Medicare, then private insurers will take, take up those um, same flexibilities. So this is the, the first bill that we're going to be talking about. This is S-368 and H.R. 1332. Um, this is the Telehealth Modernization Act, and it does a few things. It removes restrictions on the location of the patient. This allows patients to receive telehealth wherever they are included in their home. It also allows HHS to expand the types of practitioners that are eligible to practice telehealth. It makes it easier for HHS to add new services eligible to be done via telehealth. And it allows federally qualified health centers and rural health centers to provide telehealth services. And finally, it allows telehealth to, use, um, to be used for required face-to-face -face visits for hospice appropriately. So, I put up here, you don't have to memorize this, but I listed as of uh, April 8th, um, the sponsors for these bills on the Senate and the House side. Uh, you can look back on this and see if any of the legislators that you are meeting with uh, are sponsors already and you can thank them. And if they're not, you can um, advocate that they sign on and become a sponsor. 
This is the other bill. This is just a house bill. Um, it's protecting access to post COVID-19 telehealth act. And this allows the secretary of HHS to temporarily waive telehealth restrictions during future public health emergencies. It requires a report on telehealth utilization and access during the pandemic. It allows FQHCs and RHCs to provide telehealth services. And it also removes restrictions on the patient's location, allowing patients to receive telehealth where, wherever they are, including at home and sites designated by HHS. And the next page, this also lists those who are co-sponsors for this bill. And again, um, this is a resource that you, know, you can look at to see if whoever you're meeting with is already a sponsor, then you're gonna wanna say thank you to them. And if not, you're gonna ask if they're willing to co-sponsor this legislation. So then there's, there's another bill that was um, a really more of an omnibus telehealth bill that was introduced in the previous Congress, which is something that many of the ideas in it, we absolutely support. And if this bill is reintroduced, which we believe it will at some point, we would ask that legislators sign on and um, become a sponsor to this legislation when it's reintroduced. We don't know exactly what it will look like, but in the past, it included everything that HR 366 and um, S 368 and HR 1332 did, as well as um, allowing HHS to waive restrictions on providers, modalities and services, expanded access to telebehavioral health services, including in the home, expanded access to tele emergency services made it easier for HHS to add new services eligible to be done via telehealth, expanded access to telehealth in Native American health facilities, and other provisions that would remove telehealth barriers. So in this case, just you know, flag the idea that this was a bill that um, introduced in last Congress was important to our community and that we would urge that they support that when it's introduced. So these are the specific legislative asks that I was um, just discussing. Uh, you, you should note that both the two bills that um, we referenced are bipartisan pieces of legislation. If you're meeting with House of Representatives, you're gonna ask for them to co-sponsor HR 1332 and HR 366. And if you're meeting with senators, you're gonna ask them to co-sponsor S-368. Um, share the fact sheets with everything legislators need. And if you have any questions or need follow-up information, please contact IDF for more information. Um, points to include, you wanna make sure these are the, the different types of asks and um, information that we're gonna want you to share. You wanna thank the legislators for passing the Medicare IVIG demonstration, uh, which was passed last year and share with them that our ultimate goal is to make this permanent and that we may call on them for help um, as we advocate for that. And then you're also gonna share information about the protecting the immunocompromised collaborative and the importance of protecting individuals who are immunocompromised um, during the pandemic and beyond, and also share information about plasma donation awareness um, and that we have submitted language, which um, you'll hear more about when um, our consultants talk more about the issues, but we have submitted language to the Appropriations Committee to encourage the HHS to um, put funding into awareness for plasma donation that will help our community. And specifically, we want to um, support uh, the co-sponsorship of the legislation noted below for representatives um, as listed here, the, those bills and for senators, S-368. 
Um, also, you're going to want to um, support the CONNECT Act when it is reintroduced and let them know that if they're if you're not clear about certain things that they can contact IDF with any questions and follow up. Uh, now I'm gonna pass it on to Becca Russ, who will be talking about effective advocacy. Thanks, Lynn. So now that Lynn's kind of given you an overview and refresher of the issues and kind of what you're gonna be advocating for on Advocacy Day, I just wanna go through a couple of slides talking about effective advocacy and some of the logistics of your meetings on um, April 28th. So first and foremost, I just wanna talk about a couple of ways that you can advocate for people with PI. So the first is to share your stories and experiences with policymakers. So this is one of the best ways to advocate for the community because it's essentially putting a face on the issue that you're discussing. Also, you can testify at hearings, and this is a really great way to reach um, a large number of lawmakers at one time while you're sharing your personal experiences. Also, working with other patient organizations on health access issues is a great way to advocate as well. So there are a lot of organizations across the entire nation that have very similar policy priorities to IDF and the PI community. So, it's a really great idea to kind of partner with those um, individuals and organizations to work towards those common goals. Also mobilizing other members of the PI community is a great thing as well. So if you maybe have friends or family members that are part of the community but are not yet engaged in advocacy, it'd be a great idea to kind of try and mobilize them and get them involved. Additionally, responding to action alerts. So I'll touch on this a little bit more later in the slides, but this is a really um, easy and timely way as well to get involved in the different issues that IDF and the community are advocating for. And then lastly, which is what you'll um, be doing on Advocacy Day, which is emailing, writing, and meeting with your officials. So this is the most um, you know, basic way to uh, get in touch with your legislators and ask them to take action on certain issues. So as you're advocating to legislators and possibly um, agency officials, the most important thing to remember is that your voice matters. So you and other members of the PI community have a tool that lobbyists just don't have, which is your real personal stories and experiences. And essentially what this means is that people with PI and their families are the most effective at demonstrating how a policy or an issue is going to impact them in their lives. Additionally, just by reaching out to your legislators and their staff, like you will be on advocacy day, you're showing that people like you have, you know, valuable concerns that need to be addressed and that you're not just going to be ignored, that they need to look at these issues and um, work on a plan to address them. Additionally, by making your voice heard to legislators and meeting with them like you will be, this is a great way to create personal connections with your members of Congress. And you know that in itself is a great thing, but additionally, when you're kind of trying to advocate for a legislative ask like you will be, this is a great way to have them consider supporting um, an issue that they may not have been inclined to support in the past. And then lastly, it's really important to remember that as a constituent and a voter, these legislators and members of Congress have a vested interest in addressing your concerns. Um, you know, their biggest duty is to serve their constituents. So, you know, making your voice heard and talking about the issues that are important to you is a really important thing. So congressional meeting logistics. Um, this year, again, obviously we're doing the virtual format. So I just wanna go through a couple of points here about the meetings that are kind of important to know. The first is that groups will include attendees from the same state. So let's say you're from California, everybody that's in your meeting group will be from California as well. Additionally, groups will not include an IDF staff person. So while we would love to you know, join all of your meetings, obviously there's only three of us. Um, so just wanna make sure you know that we will not be sitting in on those meetings. Additionally, almost all of the congressional meetings will be occurring um, using Zoom. So 
while there may be a few offices here and there that might request um, you know, a plain conference call, most of them will be using Zoom. So just make sure you're dressing to impress um, if you're gonna have your camera on and um, just be understanding that some offices um, may have Zoom fatigue like a lot of us do. So they might not be utilizing that video feature, um, but you know, just make sure you're prepared in case they do. Additionally, all meetings are scheduled in Eastern Standard Time. So when you're looking at your schedule, just um, be cognizant that those um, meeting times are in Eastern. And then lastly, meetings are scheduled for 15 minute intervals. So, um, you know, while they may end early or go longer, just be prepared that that's the standard time frame, and that's likely the amount of time you'll be able to speak with your legislator. So meeting with your legislator prior to the call. These are a few things just to keep in mind before you actually start your meeting with your representatives. First is to review the materials. So Lynn gave you guys a great overview and kind of a refresher on um, what those asks and priorities are. But it's a really great idea to, on the Advocacy Day website, check out that step two um, portion that talks about the legislative issues you'll be advocating for. Additionally, it's really great to chat with your fellow meeting participants. So um, we're gonna get into that a little bit later in the presentation, but there's actually a feature on your online portal that will allow you to chat with those who will be in your group for your meetings. So that's a great idea as well. And then additionally, calling in five to 10 minutes early really provides everybody with some time to kind of prepare, get ready for what they're gonna say, um, and just overall be ready when that person joins the call from the legislative office. During these 10 minutes early that you're gonna call, it's great to designate a call leader. So a lot of times when we're doing these virtual meetings or um, you know, calls with offices, it's really easy to accidentally talk over each other and, and get a little jumbled. So just make sure you're designating one person who's gonna kind of lead that conversation. And then lastly, identify the name of the staff person or member of Congress you'll be meeting with. So during your call, make sure you first clearly introduce all the participants and explain the mission of IDF. Then you want to introduce, uh, have the person you're speaking with introduce themselves as well. Succinctly describe the issues, talk about the asks and um, the educational materials that you have. Create a you know, concise, poignant story to um, you know, explain the issue and put a face on it. Ask what you would like the legislator to do and then offer IDF as a resource. Um, you know, we always say we don't expect you to be an expert on the issue, um, but you know, just offer us as a resource if they need it. And then lastly, make sure you say thank you. So just a couple more meeting pointers, especially um, you know, in the virtual world we're living in. Allow that designated leader to guide the call. Like I said, you don't wanna be talking over each other. So kind of just let them take the lead on that. Be polite, even if you don't agree with them. Sometimes you don't see eye to eye, but you know, just remain polite and professional. If asked a question, answer it honestly. And if you don't know the answer, um, just let them know that IDF will get back to them and make note of that in your meeting notes. Additionally, don't expect the member or the staff member to commit on the spot. That's not, um, doesn't happen very frequently. So just provide IDF contact information for follow-up. And then lastly, again, make sure you're showing appreciation for their time and uh, attention. Making your pitch. So just a couple of um, high points to make sure you're remembering as you're making your pitch, using your own authentic voice, sharing those clean, logical arguments, using those talking points that we'll be providing you with, making a solid, pervasive case with those, telling a true story and using personal examples. Again, this connects the issue to real people asking for the outcome you want. So you wanna make sure you leave the meeting um, you know, with them knowing exactly what you want them to do. And then lastly, again, can't emphasize this enough, thank the listener for their time. And speaking of thank you, um, the kind of last step in your advocacy day um, efforts are going to be following up. So you will have continued access to that online portal after advocacy day. So you wanna make sure um, using that portal, you're providing us with some thorough meeting notes, including any information or questions that might've been mentioned during the meeting. Um, and then additionally, we will be providing you with a sample thank you note for you to um, 
you know, edit, sign, and send to your legislators. And not only is sending these thank you notes polite, which, you know, we all know, um, we appreciate thank you notes. It also presents another opportunity to um, state the ask and, you know, keep the issue on their minds as well as keeping IDF on their minds. So just make sure you're sending those um, thank you notes and following up with the offices to keep the ball rolling. And then if this is kind of something that interests you, if you're really um, interested in getting involved in advocacy, these are a couple ways to get involved um, with IDF for advocacy. The first, which I'm sure you're all aware of, is IDF's um, annual advocacy day. We also have our health access advocates who are kind of our all-stars who advocate in their home states. We have 2021 state advocacy workshops. We have our action alerts, um, which we have within our website that mobilize our community members. And then we lastly have our advocacy playlist, which educates the community about um, different policies we may be working on. And if you have downtime, which you may between your meetings, here are a couple things just to check out. We're gonna have a social media toolkit, so you can use those sample posts to you know, tag your representatives and whatnot. Exploring the IDF Patient Advocacy Engagement Toolkit. This is a really great resource, especially for some of the newer phases that we're seeing this year to brush up on advocacy. And then lastly, learning about IDF's public policy priorities. And like I said, those are all included within our advocacy playlist. So here is the IDF social media information if you're interested in tagging us when you're posting your advocacy day setup. And then lastly, if anyone wants to sign up for action alerts, these are the quick steps here. Just go to that link, click sign up for action alerts, and then it's just enter your email and zip code and you're all done. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much everything we have on advocacy and the meetings for the event. So I'm gonna pass it over to the Figury Drinker team to talk a little bit more about Congress and some other information for everyone. Well, thank you, Becca. This is Nick Minetto with Fagri Drinker Consulting. I just wanted to say a quick thank you to IDF for our partnership with the organization. It's hard to believe we're in our fifth year now and looking forward to Advocacy Day 2021. This is just a picture of me and my colleagues, Megan and Nisha, whom you'll be hearing from as well. We're gonna just talk about a couple of key items today and I'm gonna do a little overview of Congress and what Congress is doing overall just so you have a little framing as you go about your meetings. All right, so just a brief overview. I know many of you are well aware of the nature of our, of our national government right now, but we did have a lot of activity over the past several months. We have a presidency that is controlled by the Democratic Party, President Biden. In the US Senate, we have a 50-50 split, which is the you know, basically the narrowest you could possibly have it with Vice President Harris breaking ties when those tie votes occur. Uh, we don't need to go into incredible amounts of detail on Senate parliamentary procedure, but as many of you may know, a 60 vote threshold has typically been a standard for bringing most legislation to the Senate floor for advancement and that's relevant because of some of the activities that you're seeing right now that are playing out, uh, including the recently enacted legislation responding to the COVID-19 crisis, as well as some of the activity that's going on right now in terms of a potential infrastructure package uh, can be advanced using another procedure that allows for a simple majority vote and could bypass that 60 vote threshold. And you have a lot of ongoing debate playing out right now about the question of the filibuster, and whether or not the filibuster for legislation is or is not retained given some pressure on uh, the Democratic majority when it comes to bringing certain bills to the floor. The real nut here that I'm just gonna leave you all with is that it's a challenge time right now in Washington in terms of the level of bipartisanship. Um, there are a lot of questions happening on a daily basis around major big ticket pieces of legislation and how they will or will not move forward. And that's just really bringing, that, that's impacting the larger process and what we're seeing play out. 
Over in the House of Representatives, the other chamber of Congress, we have a chamber that is also controlled by the Democrats, but a little more narrow of a margin than they had during the last Congress. And with many offices already looking toward the 2022 midterm elections, that is already coloring activity, even though we're only here in spring of 2021. Again, the point here is just giving you a little bit of this color and background so you're aware of the overarching climate that Congress is operating within. The other item that I'll just note here is that like any, uh, after any election year, our election of course was last November, after every cycle, you typically have a period of time where you have some shakeups or turnover in Congress because of people who either retire or who were defeated. And that includes changes in terms of leadership in many of the key committees that we and IDF tend to spend its time um, advocating with that have jurisdiction over programs like Medicare, Medicaid, uh, the individual marketplace, NIH research funding, you name it. And the point here is that we have had a lot of changes on all of these committees during this past cycle. And what it means for you as advocates is that you're having a lot of offices who are maybe are coming into new roles, or offices who have changed roles because of all that has happened here in Washington. So you may get a flavor for that during some of your meetings. So just again, a, a top level note here, this is not something we need you to get uh, overly focused on, but the big ticket item that you're probably, again, you've been hearing a bit about probably back at home too, is the proposal from President Biden to commit a significant amount of money to a large infrastructure plan uh, over a period of time, a multi-year period of time. Um, this is focused on a variety of infrastructure, including things like bridges and roads, and also extending into areas like healthcare. Uh, one of the items that we were most interested in in the healthcare sector would be a proposal to spend a significant amount of money to support people in home, receiving care in their home. Uh, this, as you know, is a hot topic, particularly as the country uh, ages and other challenges, particularly given the pandemic, the idea that we need to better support uh, pa patients and people receiving care in their home, including home-based care for people who were unable to leave the home. So it was very interesting to see this provision included. Um, we're gonna see a lot more details over the next uh, weeks and months to come as this legislation takes more definition and shape, including potentially ways to offset or pay for some of the costs through potentially changes to uh, benefits uh, for prescription drugs and payments for prescription drugs. So it's a lot to come a lot that will be playing out over the next several weeks and months, and certainly items that IDF will be watching closely to see if there are items that we need to engage upon or flag for your, your engagement. Again, just putting that out there so you have a, a little bit of context as to what is the dominant issue or the dominant issues that are occupying the time of Congress as you prepare for your meetings. So again, the overall the ticket here, I want to just make clear, what does it mean for you and your meetings? Um, you've got an administration and a Congress who are focusing on a number of high level, big ticket items like infrastructure, like continuing to respond to the COVID pandemic, uh, which occupied a good chunk of their time during the first several months of this year. Um, this, you know, you may see this play into some of your meetings. Staff may reference these pieces of legislation or how it's impacting their or their boss's time, especially uh, for members who sit on key committees. You know, staff were a bit challenged during February and March as they were passing the COVID package, and we anticipate some of these same staff will be similarly taxed if we move forward with infrastructure. It's a very fluid and changing, ever-changing landscape. It continues to be that way, I think, for the foreseeable future. It also, as I mentioned before, it has been a challenging time for bipartisanship. And one of the great things about the issues that IDF works on is that you have been really an exemplary item when it comes to building bipartisan support in Congress. So it is one of the strongest assets of your agenda and it's something that can really help be a bridge during a time where we are not seeing, again, a, hundred, uh, a significant amount of interest when it comes to, to bipartisanship. Move on to the next slide and I'll segue it over to my colleague, Nisha. Great, thank you, Nick. So I'm Nisha Kaspa from Fagreed Drinker and I know you heard from Becca about the logistics of Advocacy Day and what you should foresee and I'll touch upon similar points. So I think What's worth noting to yourself is one, there are two parts to being a great advocate in my opinion. One is just feeling prepared for the meeting and two, recognizing and repeatedly telling yourself that you know your, your story best 
what you've experienced and what solutions you would like them to see. Um, most staffers are juggling multiple issue areas and are constantly going from one meeting to another, learning about new and existing policy issues, but they may have, have some broad understanding of what it means to be immunocompromised or familiar with your legislative priorities or asks. But be confident, confident that you are bringing a perspective of information that they most probably have not heard before. So to that end, ideally your group's pitch should allow the staffer to walk away with understanding two main points in my opinion. One, what it means to be immunocompromised. Two, what challenges the community has faced. And three, what actions you would like them would like the office to do. Um, being succinct, as Becca had mentioned earlier, is key. So when all our world went virtual last year, um, so did Advocacy Day and so did Hill Visit. So staffers of the past year have adjusted to the new remote setup and, and have continued to do that throughout the year. So they'll switch on their video or stay on audio as they can see fit and feel comfortable, but recognize that you know, don't take it personally, it's okay, it's just a symptom of Zoom fatigue and you can continue continue to proceed with your meeting as you had scheduled and kept in mind. Don't take it personally. Um, as far as engagement um, of topics, not surprisingly, most of everyone's attention was and still is on the pandemic. So it's helpful to maybe start the conversation with how the, how the pandemic has impacted your daily life. Um, but then expand to how these challenges existed before and only were exacerbated with the pandemic. So it'll be helpful to pivot from current issues, ongoing issues that the community has faced. So in an effort to stay organized, structured, and ensure you had all the points you want to get across, um, it's kind of helpful to have a framework or maybe a formula. So first, is to, before Advocacy Day, IDF will connect you with the other advocates that will be in your meeting. And as Becca had mentioned, um, it's really key to assign rules, um, des designate the order as to how you guys will approach your meeting um, to make sure you guys fit into that 15 to 20, 20 minute um, block of time that you have with any given office. So I know here on the slide are about seven general questions that you should have answered in your mind. Don't be overwhelmed at all. There are all is all questions that you can easily answer. So first is key to introduce who you are, where you're located, and identify yourself as an IDF advocate. What have you experienced being an being an individual living with PI? So this is you know this is where your personal story comes in. So once you give that background, second is to highlight what the office can do, uh, what actions you would like them what would like them to take, and why the office should care about the issue and there might be helpful to know about the elected officials legislative history, leadership roles on any relevant committees. And then lastly, after giving your background, making your issue relevant to the office, next is to kind of open up the discussion to the staffer, what questions do they have? What un unanswered questions do you plan on following up on? And how else you can be helpful to the staff? And this goes without saying, including of course, with thanking them for their time, um, and how, how, how you can perceive being helpful in the, in the near future. These are six general pieces of advice. Um, this is you know pretty straightforward, but happy to go through each one. So obviously thank the staff for their time um, and highlight any issues um, their, their boss may have championed. If you're from their jurisdiction um, and like something that they did, be sure to mention it. Once again, adding that personal touch never hurts. Be concise. Um, remember that, you know, any staffer sees multiple advocates throughout the year and even probably on the same advocacy day that you're seeing them. So I want to make sure that you can leave them with solid points that they can take back to their boss. So sometimes less is more, um, might be obvious, be friendly, be positive. Um, sometimes, you know, you can, you know, we don't anticipate any of your meetings to be contentious in any, in any way, but if it is, it's always nice to just be positive at the end and gracious. Um, be prompt with follow-up as quickly as the meeting goes is as quickly as sometimes these, these conversations need to be followed up on. So having that prompt follow-up gives, you know, you and IDF a good credibility as a responsible, engaging group that probably the office will be more interested in continuing to um, engage with in the future. 
And lastly, this goes without saying, staying away from anything political, focus on the PI community, that's what you're there for, and the priorities that we've outlined today. So the next slide, we'll talk about um, the advocacy day priorities that were highlighted earlier in this presentation. One, protections for the immune compromise, two, expand access to healthcare in the home, and three, awareness of plasma donation. So last year when the pandemic began, the Protecting the Immunocompromised Collaborative was formed. This was um, led by five organizations, IDF, along with the AIDS Institute, ARDA, the American Autoimmune Related Diseases Association, the Lupus Foundation of America, and Susan G. Coleman. These organizations came together to have a single unified voice in addressing challenges commonly faced by the immunocompromised community. And in the past year, we can go to the next slide, um, the collaborator has been extremely engaged and active in submitting policy letters to CDC, um, congressional leadership, the National Academies, the National Governors Association. All these letters can actually be found on the collaborator's website, the www.immunepolicy.org. Um, and we also want to highlight something that is worth um, noting that's on the website is a recording to a congressional briefing that the collaborative hosted last month that only elevated the challenges the immune compromised community has faced throughout the, throughout the pandemic. So three main points that were highlighted during that, that meeting was um, accessing care challenges, caregivers challenges, and COVID-19 treatment and vaccine challenges. And the reason I bring this up is that when you do those follow-up touch points at the Hill, it might be worth also flagging one, the website, and two, the recording to this briefing as a resource to the office if they were unable to attend. Um, now I'll give it to my uh, colleague, Megan Herber, who go over the two other priorities that you'll be bringing up on Advocacy Day. Thanks so much, Nisha, and thank you everybody for your time and attention uh, listening to this training so far and also on Advocacy Day itself. Your, your advocacy really does make a difference and has advanced the IDS legislative priorities in the past, and we're confident that you'll be able to uh, continue that legacy of, of uh, talking to your members of Congress and convincing them of the importance of supporting people with PI. Um, so I'll just really quickly, you know, Lynn already went over the congressional priorities and asked for this year. So I'm just reiterating them here um, as Nisha went over again on the immunocompromised piece. Um, and then I will touch on the healthcare at home and the plasma donation priorities one more time really quickly, just so that everybody feels like they've gotten the information um, a few times in different ways. Um, so as Lynn talked about, we were very fortunate to get the Medicare IVIG demonstration project extended in law at the end of last year. Our champions, Representative Doris Matsui from California and Representative Kevin Brady from Texas, bipartisan, um, really led that effort and, and got that bill passed into law. Um, so now the Medicare demonstration project is extended for the next three years through 2023. Um, and then they've also expanded the cap on enrollment from 4,000 to 6,500 people. Um, and we were getting close to that 4,000 cap um, at the end of last year. So we're, we're confident now that anyone who is eligible for the demonstration project um, and wants to apply to enroll in it should be able to, and there should be room for you. Um, so we're very happy with that and that, that access to IVIG uh, treatment in the home will still be available in the Medicare program for the next few years. And as Lynn mentioned, of course, we want to thank the members of Congress for passing that into law and then talk about in the future, we, we do want this to be a permanent benefit. It's been a demonstration project for a number of years now. Um, and we think that it not only saves lives and is more convenient and is a great option for patients, but it also saves money because if you're getting your IVIG infused in your home, you're not getting it infused in a hospital or a clinic or another setting um, that's more expensive to the Medicare program. So it's, it's a win-win-win um, and we look forward to working with Congress and with the administration uh, CMS that runs the Medicare program on extending that into a permanent benefit, um, hopefully before this next round of the demonstration project expires in 2023. 
So a little bit more on plasma donation. As you all know and connected with IVIG, um, IVIG would not be possible without plasma donation. Um, and plasma protein therapies that many people with PI rely on um, are, it's not just a standard drug like an aspirin. It's a, it's a complicated drug um, and it relies on plasma donation from other people. Um, and so they, and it is used to treat uh, a variety of rare chronic and life-threatening conditions such as PI. Um, so what the IDF has been working on, and, and you may have seen plasmahero.org, but just making sure, especially during the pandemic as people are not leaving their houses as much um, and maybe not going to their traditional healthcare uh, settings or otherwise, um, that plasma donation is still very, very important. And the, the treatments that many people with PI rely on, rely on or are dependent on uh, the plasma donation and then the development of the plasma protein therapies. Uh, so with Congress, we have been talking to Congress about ensuring awareness of the importance of plasma donation. They've done some work around the importance of blood donation. Similarly, we think they should uh, look at the importance of making sure that people know that donating plasma is something they should keep doing. Um, so uh, you can feel free to direct your members of Congress to plasmahero.org to learn more. Um, we don't have a specific legislative ask at the moment. Um, we have requested some review in the appropriations process, but by the time you guys hit the hill, that, that process will be over. So we're just looking kind of for general support and awareness of plasma donation. Oh yes, and this is the appropriations report language that we requested. So you'll see in, it's a, it's a long paragraph, but you'll see in green um, that the committee, which would be Congress is directing um, HHS to have that education and awareness campaign. So that is, what we're asking Congress, uh, currently what we're asking Congress to look at, but again, uh, the appropriations process will be largely complete, um, at least from an advocacy perspective by the time you guys hit the Hill. So it's more general support rather than asking members of Congress to sign on to a specific letter or ask. And lastly, I just wanted to reiterate again, the telehealth bills that Lynn already touched on. These two bills in the green and the blue boxes are the most tangible ask of, of your members of Congress for this year's Advocacy Day. Um, so if they want to be able to say, yes, I, I talked to IDF and I took the action they asked me for, um, this is the easiest check the box thing that they can do. Um, on the Senate side, they can support Senate Bill 368, the Telehealth Modernization Act. On the House side, they have two options. Of course, we'd love if they support both. They're very similar bills with similar intentions, um, H.R. 1332, which is the House version of the Telehealth Modernization Act, and H.R. 366, um, the, the post-COVID-19 Protecting Access to Telehealth Act. Both of these bills, as well as the Connect for Health Act, which is a large telehealth bill that's been introduced in multiple Congresses and is not yet reintroduced this Congress. It had to be um, as January started a new Congress, uh, they have to reintroduce bills and the Connect for Health sponsors have been working to update their legislation from previous iterations. Um, so they will be doing it, uh, they just have not yet. But those first, well, all three bills really, um, as Lynn mentioned, address a lot of uh, Medicare restrictions that currently exist um, that don't allow a lot of telehealth practice in the Medicare program, um, a lot of those restrictions have been lifted during the COVID pandemic. Therefore, um, these bills are looking to make those uh, flexibilities that have been granted during the pandemic permanent after the pandemic is over. Um, so there's a number of different provisions in each of the bills and, and they approach things slightly differently. But the, the point that you need to know is that it, it lifts the restrictions in the Medicare program. And as Lynn mentioned, um, although these bills are mostly pretty much focused on Medicare, uh, it does have implications for the rest of the healthcare industry, whether it's commercial insurance plans or Medicaid programs, just in that a lot of times uh, health insurance aligns itself with Medicare. And so the more that Medicare covers, uh, the more that private insurance may be interested in covering uh, as well and restrictions that they'd be interested in lifting. So things like making sure that federally qualified health centers are allowed to practice telehealth, making sure that the patient can be in any location, 
before the pandemic, the patient had to be in a very specific rural area. They had to show up to a clinic, a specific type of clinic, and then get their telehealth while they're at this clinic rather than just getting telehealth at home. Um, so these bills would address a lot of those issues and, and make it much easier for Medicare patients and Medicare beneficiaries to uh, have access to telehealth. So we're supportive of that under the overall premise that uh, healthcare access in the home is important both during the pandemic and for patients with PI who are immunocompromised, it's important all the time. And I think that wraps it up. Yes, so thank you very much. And I'll turn it back to Lynn, Becca, and Jamie. Thank you. Th thank you, Megan. And also thank you, uh, Nisha and Nick, as well as Becca. And I also want to really thank uh, Jamie Sexton, who oversees our whole Advocacy Day effort. She's done a great job behind the scenes and um, will be available. If you have any questions, you should um, contact Becca at the email on, on the screen. And just thank you for everything. We want to thank, um, give a special thanks to our the generous support of CSL Bearing, Griffles, and Takeda for making this possible. And we really appreciate all your support for this effort and for all the efforts that you've uh, supported um, with IDF. Alrighty, everyone. So for those of you who are participating in the congressional meetings on Virtual Advocacy Day, I'm going to pass it over to Lincoln Clapper, who is from Advocacy Associates, and he's just going to walk you through the portal that you're going to be using for your meetings, as well as some other information to keep in mind. So Lincoln, I'll pass it over to you. Okay, hello. My name is Lincoln Clapper. I'm with Advocacy Associates. And uh, I want to spend a few minutes kind of walking you all through how you're going to be navigating your portal for your online schedules um, for your Capitol Hill meetings. Um, and so that being said, I will jump right into it. So you all will be getting an email from our system on uh, Wednesday, April 21st, uh, and it'll come from advocacy day at advocacyassociates.com, highlighted here in green. Within that email will be a link to your schedule for your Capitol Hill meetings. And that link is highlighted here in red. It's a one-click login. Your account's already been created. Your password's already been created. Once you click on that link, it'll automatically launch you into the dashboard. If for some reason you feel like you haven't gotten this email from us by close of business, Wednesday, April 21st, go ahead and check your spam or junk folder and more than likely ended up there. If you do find it in your spam or junk folder, um, please unmark it as spam, as this is going to be the, our main way of corresponding with you uh, over the next several days and, and throughout the day of the event for any uh, changes and updates. We want to make sure you're getting that correspondence. Now, if you click on that link and you end up, uh, sometimes there are certain browser settings that don't save cookies properly, or uh, you, know, you may become logged out of your schedule accidentally for some reason. You're going to end up at a login page that'll look like this. If you end up at a page like this, what you want to do is click on the send me a sign in link button. Don't try to enter a username or password. Click on the send me a sign in link button. Input the email address that you registered for this event with. Click send email and then you'll get a new refreshed link to your schedule automatically from our system. If for some reason you're still not able to get in or you're having issues getting into the portal, go ahead and go to the support tab. Indicate that you're having trouble accessing your account. Fill out that form. That'll go directly to our development team and then they'll be in touch momentarily to get any of those issues resolved. When you're launched into the main dashboard, you're gonna see uh, all of your confirmed meetings on the top part of the page. Any pending meetings that we're still working on will appear on the bottom as TBD. Generally, one week out when you'll be getting your schedules, uh, we've got about 75% of our meetings confirmed at that point. So uh, don't be surprised if one or two of your meetings are still TBD. That's perfectly normal, and you'll see those slotted in appropriately as we confirm those last few over the next week leading up to the day of the event. Please also know that all times listed on your schedule are displayed in Eastern time. Uh, this is uniformed across the whole platform. We have taken into account where each of you are located, so everybody will have a schedule that takes place during normal business hours for where you live, but your schedule will reflect Eastern time for your meetings. I'll be reviewing some information later about reminder emails that our system sends out 
just to help keep everybody on track across the various time zones. Now, in order to access the content for each meeting, all you want to do is hover your mouse over any part of that module, click on it, and you'll be launched into the meeting dashboard, which will look like this. You'll have the time and date of your meeting at the top, followed by who you're going to be speaking with in that office, whether it's the staff, member of Congress, or both. If you have a meeting lead that's been assigned to your meeting by IDF, you'll see that person's name displayed there. If not, that area will be blank. Now, in order to access the video component of this meeting, go ahead and click on the Join Online Meeting button. This will open up the video component. Uh, 99 out of 100 meetings will take place on the Zoom platform, um, so be prepared for that type of uh, module to appear. Uh, some offices choose to use their own, whether it's WebEx or Teams or something different, but most, if not all, of your meetings are going to take place on the Zoom platform. Not all meetings will have the video capability. I think there's maybe a handful of offices that only have a dial in and that's purely based on their office policy. And you'll have a disclaimer on that button if there is no video component. Along with each meeting is also a dial in information. So that information will be listed beneath the join online meeting button. If you're not able to access via your computer, you can of course dial in and participate in every single meeting as well. In the upper right hand corner will be a list of all of your talking points. Followed by that will be a list of all of your supplemental documents. Simply click on each document. It will open up in a separate tab on, um, in, on your browser. It won't take you away from your schedule. So you can have your schedule, your documents, and your Zoom platform all open at the same time. will make it real easy to navigate back and forth between the three uh, and also to reference during your discussions with each office. Beneath that will be a list of all the attendees who are going to be in that meeting with you. There may or may not be some relevant contact information there. You can also message each other through our peer-to-peer -peer chat function. Click on the blue chat bubble and you can send a direct message to another advocate. If somebody is trying to message you, you will get a notification about that from our system that somebody has sent you a message. On the left-hand side is our report form area. The first one is the check-in feature. We're asking everybody to check in five minutes prior to the start time. I'll be reviewing that information later as well. But essentially what this does, it's an attendance report that we're going to be sending the IDF team to show who was present and who was not for each meeting. This does not affect your ability to get into the video component. It's not, they're not uh, linked the same, uh, but it is useful information to have after the event. So just go ahead and click that button whenever you're ready to join or, or shortly after the meeting concludes. So now we were, to let us know you were there. Beneath that is the send thank you note. This will create an automated thank you email that's been crafted by the IDF team uh, on your behalf for you to send to the office. Uh, the, the body of the email has already been created. You can of course edit it and customize it and personalize it however you'd like. Our system will also pull the staffer's email for who you met with as well um, for contact information. You can open this in one of two ways. Click the blue open email button. That will create uh, an automated pre-written email on whatever your native platform is on your laptop. And what I mean by that is, for example, I use Outlook on my laptop. And so if I were to click that button, it would pull up an automated Outlook email. Your device may not have that, which is fine. You can click on those copy clipboard buttons beneath that and then paste it into your Gmail or your Yahoo or whatever platform you use to send the email. Beneath that is the meeting report form. These are uh, your standard feedback questionnaire that the IDF team would like each of you to answer. So go through after the meeting concludes. Please take some time to answer those one by one. When you get to the bottom, you'll be able to submit the answers and then you'll be taken back to the homepage. This is really useful and critical information that the government affairs team needs. So please take some time after each meeting and answer those questions in the report form. Beneath that is an option to take notes. This is essentially, you can think of it as a blank notepad if you don't have pen or paper available. You can have this open during your meeting if you wanna take bullet point style notes, you can write in paragraph format, it's really up to you. It's really just an extra resource for you to utilize if, if you need it. Beneath that is an option to select whether the member of Congress attended or did not attend. We'll be sending this information to the IDF team after the event. Uh, for those of you that have participated in an event like this before, um, you very well know the meeting may be scheduled with the member of Congress, but they get pulled away to votes or they're stuck at a committee hearing, they're not able to make it. 
This really just helps us get a very accurate reporting of which members of Congress were present for the meetings. So after the meeting concludes, just mark one or the other whether the member of Congress was present, please. Now, lastly, beneath that is an option to uh, share, share or post directly to social media for you social media fans. You can access your Twitter, Facebook, or LinkedIn and drop a post after, uh, after each meeting. Once the meeting concludes, just click on the meetings tab. It'll take you back to the main page uh, where you'll be able to navigate your way to the next meeting. The legislators tab is an area where you can view bios for each member of Congress looking like this. It'll also have links to all their social media pages. So if you wanna visit their website, post on their Facebook wall or look up their Twitter handle, you're able to do that as well. The bill section will pull any relevant bills you may or may not be tracking. Uh, if you are not tracking any bills, this area will be blank. But if your organization is tracking a bill, it'll show that bill and it'll also show the vote history of how that members voted on that bill previously. The news section just pulls any relevant news uh, articles that that member of Congress has been mentioned in across various online publications. You can click on those links and read, on, read about them on your free time. And then the committee assignments will show all the committees that member of Congress serves on. The last three options on our top menu bar are the messages tab. That's where you can view those peer-to-peer -peer messages that you are sending back and forth between yourself and other advocates. The directory is a master directory for everyone in the event. So you're not just limited to people in your meetings. You can contact anyone across the platform. And the support tab is really what you wanna do if you have any questions at all, scheduling, technical support, Anything at all, go to the support tab, fill that out. That'll come directly to our team and then we'll be in touch to get any of those issues resolved. The more section is basically just a drop down menu to view uh, all the content I've already reviewed, but you can just access it a little easier from the homepage and you can see how that works as well in your free time. My last slide here, I just wanna spend some time on relevant information and reminders to keep handy. Again, check your spam or junk folder if you feel like you haven't gotten that email from us by close of business. April 21st. Our domain is at advocacyassociates.com. You may or may not need that information in your settings to unmark us as spam. Please, we're asking everybody to please call into or get into the video meeting five minutes prior to the start time. This is really just to ensure you've touched base with your group about roles, but also and mainly to make sure that everyone's present when the office joins so the, so the meeting can start on time. So go ahead and get into your video platform five minutes prior to the start time. Click that check-in button as well while you're there. All times, again, on your schedule will be in Eastern time. However, you're going to get a reminder email from us one hour prior to every single meeting throughout the course of the day. So we're constantly updating you with a link to your schedule. Don't feel like you need to keep one draft, email draft handy to, to reaccess your schedule. We're gonna make it as easy as possible for you to get back in uh, throughout the course of the day. If an office doesn't join your meeting within 10 minutes past the start time, please have your group hang up or get off the Zoom um, and have somebody from, that, from your team contact us. Our help number will be listed in the support tab for you to call as well if it's really time sensitive like that. The last thing we want is for you to hang on the line for 15, 20, 25 minutes. No one in the office has simply had a mix up we would rather be proactive, get in touch with them, and then reschedule for you later in the day. Um, but do give them a, a 10 minute buffer window uh, before contacting us. Please also know that meetings have been arranged in 15 minute blocks. These may of course go, uh, end earlier, go longer. Generally, they're going longer in our virtual environment, um, but do approach each meeting in terms of practicing your pitch and um, your talking points, knowing that the meeting has been arranged in 15 minute increments. Any changes to your schedule will be sent via email. So if there's a time change, a cancellation, an addition, anything like that will be sent via email. So again, make sure you're checking that regularly throughout the course of the day. Make sure you're in an area with good Wi-Fi connection. Please mute your microphone, uh, whether on your phone or on your computer, whenever you're not speaking. Uh, and just know your audience. You'll be speaking with both Republicans and Democrats throughout the course of the day. So just make sure you have an appropriate a background for all video meetings. And with that being said, looking forward to a very successful event. And I will turn it back over to the IDF team. Great, thank you, Lincoln. So if anyone has any remaining questions or concerns about either your meetings or any other information that we've presented, um, feel free to reach out from um, you know, email or phone to anyone at IDF.